This is a production of Cornell University. Great. Thanks, Dawn, for the introduction. And yeah, I can't express how happy I am to be back, um, be it virtually. It's an honor to come back and uh, have a chance to share what I've been up to in the four years since leaving Cornell. Uh, I still think back oftentimes, particularly in the autumn, about how gorgeous uh, the campus and all of the area is. Um, and I hope that you can all get back on campus <laughs> Uh, soon because it is something that I miss dearly. Uh, so I'm going to take you on a bit of a walk across North America in 350 meters and uh, we'll see what the 350 meters references shortly. Um, but first I wanted to acknowledge that um, you're seeing a very small portion of what UBC Botanical Garden has to offer and if any of you ever make it out to this part of my beautiful country, I'd encourage you to visit the garden. Uh, I'm uh, one of four curators here. This is the rest of our curatorial team. Um, Laura Caddy on the left curates our Alpine garden. Uh, Ryo Sujiyama in uh, the middle there is uh, the curator for our Japanese garden. And there's me on the right in the red. Behind me is Andy Hill and he curates our Asian garden, uh, quite a significant collection here. And in the back uh, with uh, the beard is Douglas Justice, and he's the Associate Director of Horticulture and Curation. So collectively, this team uh, stewards much more than you will have a chance to see today. Uh, and I wanted to acknowledge um, the work that they do. Collectively, this team um, curates and stewards close to 8,000 accessions in our garden, representing uh, 5,270 different taxa from 189 plant families uh, represented by over a thousand genera. So you'll see a small uh, snippet of our garden and if you find yourself in this part of the world please come and see us and reach out to me. I'd be happy to uh, to give you a tour of the rest of the garden as well. I also wanted to acknowledge before starting that University of British Columbia uh, is on the land of the Musqueam people. This is our local indigenous band here and the university campus in Point Grey where I'm located is on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Uh, so I wanted to acknowledge that before moving forward. To give you a sense of where I am in our vast continent for those that aren't familiar with the wild wild west, uh, this is North America, obviously, and the red circle on the upper left is the location of southern British Columbia. It's quite a, a remarkable part of the continent. If you haven't had a chance to visit, please do. We zoom in a little bit more. This is the greater Vancouver area. The Fraser River is a large, very important river here, river system for the local ecology and the local people. And the red circle that you're seeing this time is Vancouver's Point Grey campus. This is the site for our botanic garden. We have uh, a wonderful coastal situation looking out onto the Salish Sea. We zoom in a little bit further. This is Point Grey campus itself. And if you look in the lower left, you'll see another shape sort of drawn out, this long sort of peninsular space and uh, this sort of awkward space that wraps around a stadium here. This is the site of uh, UBC Botanical Garden currently. Our garden has celebrated our 103rd anniversary. And over that time, we've actually moved sites twice. Uh, we've been at this site since um, the 1970s. If we zoom in a little bit closer, this is the Botanical Garden site itself. Uh, Vancouver has seen a tremendous amount of growth over the last decades. And with that growth has come more infrastructure so what you see is our garden is currently divided in two by a four lane divided highway. This was not always the case. Um, so we have um, our Southwest gardens and our Northeast gardens. For today's talk, we're gonna focus in even further on the Northeast gardens. And in particular, the space that's outlined here are the North American gardens here at UBC. The North American gardens are comprised of four distinct garden areas representing the 
biogeographical and floristic communities of, of four um, distinct regions. The first is our BC Rainforest Garden. This is where we will start our journey of 350 meters. The second being the Pacific Slope Garden. Then we'll move to the Gary Oak Meadow and Woodland Garden. And finally, the Carolinian Forest Garden. The title of the presentation references the fact that you can walk from the beginning of the rainforest garden to the beginning of the Carolinian forest, which is the walk that we will do in 350 meters. And this is a really great um, opportunity for people to come to our garden and see the native flora of this region, but also of Eastern North America as well. So we're gonna start with our BC Rainforest Garden. Um, I, I showed you the region that we were in a little bit earlier and, and Vancouver is fortunate to be situated in one of North America's temperate rainforest regions. Um, we receive annually over 50 inches of rainfall that, that happens here and we're extremely moderated by our proximity to the Pacific Ocean. Um, our, to give you a sense of just how moderate our, um, our annual temperature in January, which is our coldest month, is 36 degrees Fahrenheit, so still above freezing. Mm -hmm. We do get snow here, but it never stays for more than a day or two. Um, and in the heat of summer in August, or sorry, July, which is our hottest month, uh, we'll reach an average of 55 degrees, so also quite moderate. We do have some heat for sure, but overall we're quite a moderate climate, and as a result we have this lush temperate rainforest environment that we're situated in. Uh, our BC rainforest garden does not look quite as lush as that first image. Uh, we are situated in an area that has been heavily developed and, and altered over time. Uh, so while this garden does seek to represent the uh, local BC rainforest plant communities authentically, there are some aspects of our local rainforest that we just can't replicate um, given um, lower humidity due to development and increased air movement and that sort of thing. Um, the garden itself, I wanted to acknowledge uh, a couple of people in the creation of it. And so the BC Rainforest Garden is actually dedicated to the man in the lower right, and his name is John Davidson. Uh, he was the first provincial botanist for British Columbia and was later brought on by the university to start um, the botanical gardens themselves uh, in 1819. And above him is a man named Al Rose, and Al Rose was a very active uh, employee at the Botanic Garden. He was the first curator for our native garden um, in the 70s and 80s. And he was, by all accounts, an exceptional field botanist and horticulturist. Um, he did a tremendous amount of work collecting plants from all over the province, uh, from our wet rainforest coast through to our dry interior, up to our um, far, far north and alpine areas. Uh, he made something like a thousand collections a year for a decade and a half uh, and to give you perspective a good collecting year for me I would probably get a 200 maybe so he was an exceptional um, individual in building these collections um, however when he retired in the 80s um, funding and uh, staffing structures didn't allow for his replacement so Al Rose built this garden that was representative of flora from all over the province, really, really rich collection. And then it was abandoned um, by, by and large for over a decade. And during that time, this garden space, a number of those plants that were not locally adapted and couldn't survive without the horticultural care had died out. Uh, a sad story, but there are some still uh, some beautiful relics from his time. And so this is what that garden looks like now. Um, we've narrowed the scope from BC native to BC rainforest native to reflect the plants that can survive and are um, locally adapted. It looks very much like some of the 
um, park spaces that happen in and around Vancouver. And in some ways that's challenging to get people to understand that they are in fact in a garden and not in a park when they're in this space. However, the trade-off is that we have some really lovely moments that happen that are fully natural expressing the local ecology. And so on the right, we see an old stump of uh, Western red cedar and our Western hemlocks grow out of these stumps. And you end up with these incredibly beautiful moments in a garden that would be almost impossible to recreate um, if this garden wasn't given that time on its own. So the, the, the balance here is that we have some some really great demonstrations of local ecology. And a number of UBC's gardens visitors are actually tourists. We have a huge tourist population. So I love this garden because people come from all over the world and within the garden itself can see intact functioning local ecology. There are a number of, uh, of accessions in here that are remaining from Al Rose's time. And I've also been fortunate to build these collections up over the last few years. And it's amazing what can happen when you get back into a garden space and, and provide that care. It's a wonderful uh, garden, uh, particularly in the early spring when things are leafing out and it's just this lush light green. And importantly, you know, the gardens themselves are not all about plants. We do a lot of work with people as well. And uh, I wanted to just highlight one particular relationship that I'm privileged to be involved in and its relevance to my role as a curator. So on the left is a white fawn lily, a plant called Erythronium oregonum. And this plant in the picture here is actually one of Al Rose's historic collections, been in the garden for uh, 35 plus years. And I've always admired it in the spring. It's a beautiful spring ephemeral, um, very, very beautiful plant. Um, and through some partnerships, I've learned that there's just so much more to this plant. Uh, so on the right, you'll see a photo of um, Tara Moreau is on the left. She is our Associate Director of Sustainability and Community Programs. And in the middle is Vanessa Campbell. Vanessa is a language specialist with the Musqueam Indian Band. Um, and then there's me on the right. And we've been working um, to do a lot of co-created programming and knowledge sharing between the Botanic Garden and the Musqueam people. And uh, through this dialogue, uh, I learned that the Musqueam, the name Musqueam for the Indian band translates to um, people of the river grass. And the story um, is so powerful related to the creation of the salmon streams that sustain the indigenous cultures here. And the story is that a double-headed serpent carved these, these streams. And in the wake of that carving of those streams, the river grass grew along these rivers. However, it's kind of been lost over time what river grass is. Um, the, written and oral histories associated with a number of indigenous cultures are only now just sort of being pieced back together. Um, and there's some talk uh, through Vanessa, she, she shared some wonderful insights with me that the plant itself, there's one story that the grass produced a, a white nodding flower in the early spring. And there's some mm. thought that it actually might be this plant. And so as a curator, my role is to you know, manage these collections and all of a sudden one of Al Rose's historic collections takes on even greater importance given its relevance to our, our local, our neighbors. The Musqueam are literally the, the garden's closest neighbors and whose land we are on. Uh, so this has been one of the really rewarding aspects of my job is working with people as much as plants. I'm gonna move on to the next garden area uh, in our 350 meter journey. Um, this is our Pacific Slope Garden. So we're moving out of one of the oldest garden areas uh, on site and certainly the oldest in the North American collections to the newest garden area. Um, a little bit about, you know, what is the Pacific Slope? The Pacific Slope uh, basically denotes the western facing slopes 
of the Coast Range Mountains and the Cascade Ranges, including the Klamath Mountains and the Siskiyous. It's, it's a, an ecosystem that ranges basically from northern uh, Washington State through Oregon and down into northern California. And this area, if you've ever been, it's truly spectacular. Uh, and it's most well known for its gigantic conifers. Um, you see a picture on the right. This was a, a trip I was fortunate to be on with some folks from the Royal Botanical Garden Edinburgh when they were doing some collecting here. And the smaller tree in the center is by all accounts a massive western hemlock, but it's completely dwarfed by these enormous Sitka spruce. And this is not an uncommon sight uh, along the Pacific Slope. It's important uh, in particular for its richness in conifer diversity. So this is a map that denotes uh, species richness in conifers throughout the world. And what you'll see is you know, we've got some hot spots you know, around Japan, Southeast Asia. The highest conifer diversity is in New Caledonia. Uh, UBC Botanical Garden doesn't have any collections under glass. We don't have greenhouses outside of our propagation facilities. So we're not gonna be growing those plants. But if you turn your eyes to North America, what you see is that region that we saw in the earlier slide, those Western slopes uh, have extremely high conifer diversity in a global context. Uh, and this is a really great opportunity for um, conifer conservation. A lot of these plants occur in very limited areas. And if you think about climate change and the projections for that, well, for the entirety of the world, but in particular that region, quite severe, you know, California's on fire. How many times do you hear that uh, a year? Um, so we're looking to turn our focus to conifer conservation. And there are projections that in light of climate change, um, our climate may actually be better suited for some of these plants in the long run. And this is some of the work that I do as a curator is planning a garden, not just for the next three, five, 10 years, but hundreds of years. And so we're focusing this garden in on the conifers. However, it's not all about conifers. We're also targeting the phagaceae, so the oak uh, family. And these are a couple of accessions that are currently in there that I don't think people think oak as being particularly gorgeous, but there are some examples. Um, Quercus calogii, the California black oak on the left, it leafs out with these sort of velvety pink leaves that. I think rival any of the magnolias in terms of beauty. And uh, Nophilithocarpus densiflorus, just with these really cute little um, nuts starting to form and a nice flush of velvety new growth. This garden is again, as I say, the earliest. So last year uh, received a very generous um, donation from uh, some of our um, network of people that support the garden. And this is how project work happens. Um, you know, so we've been sitting on this idea for a number of years. There's an injection of funds and we start to move forward. So this is some of the early work that I did with the landscape architect here, developing some concept plans and refining the scope. And I'm happy to say that just last month we started breaking ground and this is currently what this garden looks like. So you can see we've moved from a garden that has 40 years of history in the rainforest garden to one that is just currently taking shape. Tremendously excited about this garden. There's a lot of opportunity for interpretation to our, our visitors about the impacts of uh, climate change on biodiversity in our region. Fortunately, um, I, the photo I showed earlier of colleagues from the Royal Botanical Garden Edinburgh on a collecting expedition. Fortunately, we did participate in an expedition throughout this region a few years ago. So these young plants in our nursery um, are ready to go out into the garden. And as you can see, lots of conifers, uh, which is again, the total focus of this garden. We're about you know, 200 maybe meters into our journey across North America at this point, And we're gonna move into, um, it's hard to say what's my favorite of the four gardens, but this garden here is a pretty spectacular garden. So this is our Gary Oak Meadow and Woodland Garden. Um, it's a garden that is 
neither the oldest nor the youngest. It's been on site for about 15 years and is a representative of a local meadow ecosystem that occurs here in Vancouver. So this is the distribution of these Gary Oak Meadows in the wild. They are characterized um, by a plant called the Gary Oak, Quercus Garyana. It's the only oak native to British Columbia. And the range on this ecosystem you can see um, sweeps down through on the uh, eastern slopes of those coastal mountains that we were talking about when we were talking about the Pacific Slope Garden. Um, which is a lot drier. This is in rain shadow area and then comes back out to the coast in Northern California. But if you look closely uh, above the national boundary, there is a splattering of red in Vancouver. And locally, these meadows are restricted to the eastern coast of Vancouver Island, similar to the rain shadow that happens throughout the coastal mountains. There's a bit of a rain shadow um, on Vancouver Island. So warm, moist air comes over the crest, hits the island, drops most of its moisture on the west side. And there's a bit of a sunnier break, if you will, by Vancouver standards. I mean, it's still, it's, it's not Southern California, but by Vancouver standards, it's a little drier. Um, and, and with that, uh, supports a very different plant community. Most of our uh, native plant community is conifer dominated forest, large stature trees, very, very damp, very, very dark. And by contrast, these meadows that creep up into North America um, are, are open and sunny and exposed. And with that, a whole different uh, plant community exists. One of the reasons that I would like to mention the distribution is because there are a number of plants in this garden, and I'll get to the garden itself in a second, that are, um, of local conservation concern. So when we have forest or plant communities that have this type of range, fairly extensive in the United States, but just come up into, into Canada, the way that plant uh, risk uh, and threat is assessed is there's three levels. There's a provincial or state assessment, a national assessment, and then a global assessment. So a number of the plants that occur in the Gary Oak Meadows, by the very nature of it being very restricted here in Canada, are considered nationally endangered. Um, a number of these plants are not necessarily at risk of going extinct in the wild, but we are at risk of losing them in our local populations. And plants at these extended range, uh, sort of far extents of these ranges are particularly valuable for plant conservation in that they may possess genetics that allow them to be better adapted to extremes in throughout their, um, their range. So when we talk about the conservation value of the Gary Oak Meadows here, we're talking about by and large uh, population conservation as opposed to just a taxon conservation. Uh, and the Gary Oak Meadows are extremely at risk uh, here in British Columbia. I was mentioning that this is a little bit drier, a little bit sunnier, it's coastal, it's got beautiful views, and this is exactly where people want to settle. And it's estimated that um, about two and a half percent of what was originally intact Gary Oak Meadows remain. The meadows themselves are totally gorgeous. This is the Gary Oak Meadow uh, here at UBC. And what you can see is in stark contrast to the rainforest garden that I showed, open, exposed, sunny sites that just support really diverse uh, grasses and, and forbs. Um, the Gary Oak Meadow, even though it's quite limited in its distribution, if you think back to that range map in Canada, is, is actually hosts more biodiversity and specifically plant biodiversity than anywhere else in our province even though it's got such a limited range. Uh, so a very important uh, garden for conservation and, and our messaging around human impact uh, with plants um, and, and the, what people can do to help, um, help the cause. However, this garden didn't always look quite this lush. When I arrived in July of 2016, um, the, the meadow was largely dormant 
and the following spring, um, I, I did a bit of an assessment. It, my job is to care for and oversee these accessioned collections, but without knowing what's in them, it's hard to make decisions about how to best do that. So in the first year I was here, we did an inventory of this meadow and on the bottom right, you see Tim Chipchar. He's one of our horticulturists here. Uh, and I was fortunate to work with Tim. He has a number of years of field botany experience as well. So we went through this meadow and um, took herbarium specimens and, and identified all the species that were remaining in here. Um, because over time, this meadow had sort of moved around as is the case with a lot of these style of plantings. Things had moved, things had seeded around, things had died out and the records weren't always uh, kept up. When we finished the inventory and we finally you know, settled on agreement on some of the, the taxa that we were seeing in here, I don't know that I slept for about a week because I was just in shock. This meadow in certain areas had become completely overrun by um, invasive grasses, largely um, sweet vernal grass and creeping bent grass, although a few others. So while the photo on the left may look quite pretty, oh, well, look, a meadow with some camas in it, that sort of burgundy grass that you see is sweet vernal grass, and you can see that it is almost all that's left. Um, in some instances, 95% cover, and sweet vernal grass is incredibly allelopathic, so it's actively suppressing the growth and regeneration of the native plants that were in here. Um, and tackling this meadow is a bit of a, a challenge because here at UBC, we don't use um, any herbicides, pesticides. This is a garden wide mandate. Uh, and so typically in a, in a meadow restoration, you, in, a, in a situation like this, you would go in and you'd apply glyphosate uh, a couple of times and basically start from scratch. However, um, we've just been marching ahead with um, basically digging this meadow out over a series of three years. All is not lost though. Um, there were sections of our meadow that were still intact. And so this is what this meadow looks like in the spring. It's incredibly rich with ephemeral plants. Um, again, mentioning that it's a dry uh, summer area. And as much as our region is a temperate rainforest, we do experience a very significant summer drought. Um, and this meadow is totally adapted for it. So in spring, you have all these ephemerals that come up, a lot of geophytes, bulbs, things like that, but also annual plants. They put on this tremendous show. And then by midsummer, the garden is going dormant. And we were able to identify through our inventory areas in this garden that remained intact. So on the left is actually the garden at UBC. On the right is a Gary Oak meadow out on Vancouver Island I visited. And you can see that there are still a lot of similarities and, and we did have these pockets that we could pull from. And so what we've been doing is propagating those plants and as we march the meadow renovation forward, reintroducing uh, plants from those original accessions that remain. Again, it's a lot of work, um, but totally worth it because this garden is locally endangered, checks all our boxes from our mission in terms of conservation, supporting scientific research, education to the public. We have a tremendous amount of interpretive signage in this garden, um, and as well as display. It is absolutely breathtaking uh, in the display that happens in this garden. And it's, it's working. On the right is an area that was renovated two years ago, and uh, what we see here is actually more indicative of what these meadows would look like. These are the grasses, the good guys that should be here, a mix of annual and perennial forbs in growing in and amongst those grasses. And now that we've been able to rid ourselves of those allelopathic grasses, these plants are actually seeding themselves back into the garden. So no shortage of hard work, but a complete success story and, and one I'm quite proud of. And as I mentioned, the Gary Oak Meadows are, are a threatened ecosystem here, and there are a number of endangered plants that we have in this garden. This is just a few of them. Uh, some of them are quite showy and charismatic. You know, in the center are a couple of our less charismatic ones, a, 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 a sedge, Carex tumulacola, and Camosomia contorta, the little yellow flower that's a few millimeters across. Um, so not all of our conservation plants you would even notice when you walk through this garden, but it's loaded with them. 
All of these plants that you see here, though, are secure throughout the southern portion of this range of the Gary Oak Meadow. However, uh, one particular plant that I'm particularly interested in in this meadow and that we've been successful with is called golden paintbrush. And so this is a plant called Castilea levisecta. Castilea are in the Orobanchaceae family, and it's a family of plants that are largely parasitic or hemiparasitic. Um, Castilea levisecta is a hemiparasitic plant, so it parasitizes other plants, but also produces chlorophyll. So it can self-sustain, but does much better um, if it has host plants. Castilea are notoriously difficult to propagate uh, and then even more so cultivate in a garden setting. They're one of those things that people always say best left in the wild, don't even try. Um, but we've been trying here and we've had a lot of success. Uh, so Castilea levisecta, we've been able to propagate um, a few hundred of these quite successfully with a few different hosts. You can see it on the left, it's growing with a native fescue. Um, and uh, we also grow it with um, a few Crassulaceae plants. And we've now planted these out into the meadow uh, for a second year now, and we're seeing about a 60, 65% success rate, which by all accounts is very, very good for this plant. Um, so a bit of a success story here. And the, unlike the plants in the previous slide, this is a plant that is not only at risk here in BC and Canada at a national level, but is globally endangered. Extremely limited range on this plant in the wild and the same threats that face the Gary Oak Meadows here in British Columbia are present throughout um, the rest of this plant's range to the south. Um, I've been very fortunate to work with some local uh, recovery teams who have supplied us with high quality um, known provenance seeds so we can grow plants that are legitimately of conservation value for this endangered species. And finally, we're in the home stretch. We're about to cross the finish line as we run the 350 meters. We're gonna end off in the Carolinian Forest Garden. Um, this is a garden that might be confusing to, to many of you. you know, is this the flora of the Carolinas specifically? What is the Carolinian? Um, the Carolinian Forest Zone is largely a Canadian term. It, it, it originated uh, from some um, plant biologists and silviculturists um, back in the 18 and early 1900s. And it was uh, a term used to describe a very distinct forest system that shows up just in southern Ontario. So if you're familiar with the area on the top left, um, you see that there's this sweeping line that says northern limit of the Carolinian zone. And it kind of sweeps from north of Toronto down towards London and over to Grand Bend. Very, very limited distribution of this forest type in Canada. And uh, also, if you think about the development in Canada and particularly in Ontario, this is also the most densely populated and heavily human impacted region in our country. Um, so it, there's a lot of parallels between this this forest and the Gary Oak Meadows in terms of national plant conservation, northern range conservation, and education around uh, human impact in the landscape. Um, the, the photo on the left bottom does show that that light sort of lime green color is the eastern deciduous forest. And that's really what you probably would know the Carolinian as. So, uh, a, an ecosystem and, and a forest type that does have a much larger range uh, and a number of the plants that we grow here are very abundant um, south of the border but quite rare from a national perspective. Again a similarity with this garden and the Gary Oak Meadow um, is the biodiversity here is extremely high from a national level. Um, the you can see just how limited that range is, uh, but half of Canada's tree species grow in that range and over half of its vascular plant species, um, so all the grasses and, and forbs and things like that, over half of our national plant biodiversity can be found growing in these forests despite their extremely limited range. 
And on the right is typically what this forest looks like in the wild. I was fortunate to grow up in this forest when Don mentioned I spent my youth exploring the forest and propagating plants from uh, my local uh, surroundings. This was the forest I was trekking through. So I was very happy when I arrived here um, to find that a little piece of home also met me here on the West Coast. And uh, this garden it is also about 12, 13 years old. So not the oldest, not the youngest. And this is what it looks like right now. As you know, the, probably the, the most well-known aspect of the Eastern deciduous forest is its fall color. I have to say that we don't get the fall color here in Vancouver that we get back in the East, even though we're growing the same plants. Uh, and I think that's largely um, climactic. We don't get those wild swings between cold, cold nights and warm days that would very quickly break down uh, chlorophyll. Um, but we do get some nice fall color. Um, and, and again, this is the shot of that garden. You can see some lovely light coming in. However, there wasn't always lovely light coming in. When I arrived in this garden, um, it was obvious to me that a number of trees need to be cut down. So because we don't use um, herbicides here, when this garden was created, it was put on top of what used to be sort of weedy, herbaceous ornamental beds. And those plants were dug out, but a number of them were very uh, aggressive and there were a number of persistent perennial weeds. So the decision was made to plant this garden extremely densely with large stature trees uh, in an effort to shade out those uh, weeds, which is part of an integrated pest management plan when you um, don't use herbicides. Uh, however, uh, these trees were not thinned as they grew. And so the first uh, few months that I was here, I did a quick assessment. And in my first winter, we actually removed something like 85 trees from this garden. And I'm pretty sure it raised a few eyebrows. Like, did we hire the wrong guy? Why is he cutting down our garden? Um, but it was a decision that needed to be made because these trees are growing extremely fast in our climate, much faster than they would back east. And we were getting to this crucial point where um, if we let them live any longer, they would become complicated removals based on their size and proximity to one another. Um, but uh, the, the result is that the remaining trees have responded exceptionally well. And some of those trees are extremely important to us here at UBC. Um, UBC Botanical Garden is part of the Plant Collections Network and for magnolias and, and maples. Uh, Cornell Botanic Garden is part of this group for the maples. And, and as a result of some of that thinning, a number of our um, key accessions have done extremely well and responded well to increased light and increased air circulation. Uh, a couple of super charismatic uh, plants here, Magnolia macrophylla and Magnolia virginiana uh, are amongst our Magnolia collections. And the photo on the left is not a trick of the eye. These, these um, flowers are up to a foot across and, and just incredibly showy uh, plants. I know there was one of these outside um, the offices at Cornell Botanic Garden that unfortunately came down while I was a student due to, I think, structural concerns. Um, so I hope that the garden is considering having uh, another in its collections because they're wonderful plants. And also through the thinning, we managed to be able to successfully grow plants in the understory. So previously, um, light was not coming through this forest. After the clearing, the shrub layer in the understory has responded incredibly well. Um, rhododendrons that previously bloomed only moderately have now um, decided to put on a riot of color in the spring. This is rhododendron bassii, another of our um, threatened plants. This one's globally threatened and we have um, four accessions represented by 30 some odd plants, all of known wild uh, provenance. Uh, conservation value aside, this is just a spectacularly gorgeous plant um, that blooms in the early spring before any of the leaves come out. You see these pink puff balls in the landscape. <clears throat> and then also with, with the increased light, we can now grow plants in the understory that are herbaceous. Previously, this garden was too shady and too dense to really support these plants. And really, this is where a lot of the magic happens in this garden. Um, the spring ephemerals that 
occur in the, the woods around uh, campus, if you think about how rich and beautiful that scene is, we are now able to um, create that here. And so I've been working very hard over the last few years to create that um, with a lot of success. And I just wanted to show you uh, how we create that. So I'm fortunate um, that a number of our volunteers and our friends of the garden support me uh, financially to do wild plant collecting. And this is very important for our garden in terms of meeting our mission of um, curating a collection of uh, known provenance wild collected material and so this is probably you know the highlight of my job there are bugs everywhere i get soakers i get banged up but it's incredibly rewarding to go out on these trips and collect plants uh, to bring them back for our garden and it takes me everywhere from lakeside to forests to dry interior to alpine mountaintops and this is really um, a crucial part of my job it seems like um, you know, it, it, this would be minor, but there aren't a lot of opportunities for wild collected seed available to me unless I do collecting. Um, so a, a crucial part of what I do. And that's largely how I build my collections here at, at UBC. And so that's been a 350 meter walk across North America and some of the exciting plants and plant communities. And I encourage you all to get out into your local forest and appreciate them, uh, as well as come visit us at UBC if you can. And at this point, I'd like to thank Cornell University for the years that I spent there, the friendships and knowledge that I gained. I'd also like to thank um, CALS in particular for um, supporting the Public Garden Leadership Program and to Cornell Botanic Gardens for also making that possible. I wouldn't be where I am without it. And a special thanks to um, all the grad students. Uh, Maria is pictured here. She's the one who reached out to me initially, uh, Maria and Dawn, to invite me here to speak. So thank you. It's been a pleasure. We've got a few minutes for some questions. Well, I want to thank Ben for an absolutely fascinating presentation. And I so appreciated, Ben, that you spoke not only about the horticultural considerations of the plants in your collections, but also the botanical and uh, biogeographic considerations. So absolutely fabulous. And I will now uh, um, welcome any questions that folks may have for Ben. And Ben, you can also look in the chat feature where I believe that there is at least one question. All right, okay, I've got the chat window open now. <laughs> uh, okay, so um, um, Rec Beach, I'm just gonna address that first. It is actually <laughs> right across the road from us, yeah. So. Uh, a number of our staff at the end of a hot day in August will head straight down to the beach. Um, is prescribed, so there's a question, is prescribed uh, controlled fire used as a management tool? Um, it is not. Um, it's something that I would like to do from a demonstration perspective. However, in our Gary Oak Meadow, our, our largest issue right now are the the grasses and the grasses we're dealing with are also fire adapted. So it would be a tool that we could use if we got into situations where we were seeing um, woody plants moving in and that sort of thing. But right now, burning that meadow would not actively solve too much of the, the issue that we're dealing with. However, um, I'm glad you mentioned fire because the Gary Oak Meadows, as they exist, were also um, extremely important to the local indigenous cultures. And they persist not only because of the soils and the exposure and the climate, but also because of a history of prescribed burn by the local indigenous cultures to keep the, the area open because a number of very important food and medicine plants grow in that ecosystem. So. In the wild, fire is actually an incredibly important part of, of that, um, that ecosystem. In our garden management, not so much. It's also very difficult to set any part of the campus on fire. <laughs> and the, the rules and regulations around that are, are very, um, very tight. 
And I invite uh, any of the other participants to unmute themselves if they do have a question for Ben. Ben, let me ask a question. Um, the various collections that you showed us are more what I would refer to as naturalistic rather than highly designed. How do you interpret them for the public so that visitors can appreciate these as horticultural collections and not as what you were saying, just parks? Yeah, it's a very good question. And it is definitely one of our challenges. And the whole of UBC Botanic Garden um, by and large is focused on plants as they would occur in a natural way. Uh, we do have some uh, more formal spaces, a physic garden and a food garden and uh, sort of an events lawn with a more traditional perennial border and that sort of thing. Um, one of the things that we try and do is we, we luckily had an interpretive um, plan developed um, three years ago now um, that involved a number of very large, well-designed information boards to help people understand what it was that they were seeing. So in front of strategic locations or strategic plants or plantings, talking about the plants that they're seeing. Um, we also, um, through our database, we use a data, behind all of this is a, is a custom database uh, called Iris BG, which is a software that was developed specifically for managing um, botanic collections. And through that, we have launched uh, a garden explorer so people can go on this app and look for particular plants or based on the area that they're standing in, know what plants are around them. And we've also designed through that a number of specific tours that our, our guests can take, that will take them around to specific plants. Um, and yeah, we try and make sure that all of our collections are accurately labeled, but particularly those that are along those predetermined tours. Any final questions for Ben? Ah, here we go from Raleigh. Ah, yes, okay. <clears throat> so, uh, it, He's mentioning that we have a canopy walk here in the garden. It's actually not in my rainforest garden, it's in the Asian garden. And our Asian garden um, is planted amongst an intact uh, coastal rainforest and you can go up through the canopy. And one of the things uh, that we do get here, even though I was saying that we don't get as lush a moss sort of diversity hanging from branches and things like that. In our Asian garden in particular, because it's has an irrigation system and, and higher humidity, we do get epiphytes growing. So um, various bryophytes in the canopy and a few fern species by and large. Um, the canopy itself um, isn't sort of actively managed in that garden space beyond the way that it impacts the Asian plant collections below. So. Um, decisions are made about removals and thinning and, and planting of the overstory, but it's largely in a way uh, or decisions made about the impact that would have on the Asian plants that grow beneath. Um, and to the best of my knowledge, there haven't been any active studies up in that canopy. Um, we do engage with researchers from the university um, but largely the, the research that happens here is driven by the interests of, of the labs on campus. Um, so we provide what we can based on what they need as opposed to actively sort of directing that research. So if, if people on campus aren't study, interested in studying it, we actually don't have the capacity in our staff um, to study it. Our involvement in research is to supply material to researchers uh, as opposed to in-house research. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. So I want to again thank Ben for a, an intriguing and information-filled presentation. Thank you so much, Ben. 
We are sorry that you can't be with us in person, but look forward to seeing you again sometime in the future. I look forward to visiting. Thanks, Don. Okay, bye-bye now. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.